Well, I'm glad to be here with you today. I'm very impressed that everybody got up on Saturday morning and came in, and um, I'm sure it had nothing to do with me, but I think there's probably all kinds of goodies you're going to get over there. So uh, it's exciting to see everybody here. Um, you will see on your chairs, or you might even see around the, uh, the building, a questionnaire. It's a little orange piece of paper. So this is, if you choose to participate in this, this will actually be used for medical research. So you will be benefiting mankind. So that is my encouraging word to do it. Um, also, I'm doing this because it, it hopefully will engage everybody into what we're talking about. I oftentimes get questions and I get calls every day from corporations and from other people who, who ask, what should I do? And they want me to be sort of the, the Pied Piper of their behavioral lifestyle. And th while that's exciting and that's why we do the research, I try to remind them that I'm not the Pied Piper because you're not little rats. Instead, you make the decisions about your health. And I'm going to show you some data today that's pretty surprising stuff. And, and I'd love to uh, engage you in that by giving you a questionnaire first. If you haven't filled it out, that's fine. You can fill it out later. If you filled it out already, that's, even, that's fine too. And if you change your response, just let me know. We want to know what you're thinking. It's very important to us, okay? And so we're going to go through this little hypothetical scenario, and then I'll uh, actually show you some scientific data that will help you uh, remember what we're talking about today. There were two questions that we're going after. The first one dealt with your health. And, and let's pretend, when I say pretend, let's truly pretend that we're playing sort of a, a, a make-believe game for right now. Assume that there was a major breakthrough. I mean, like, like just a phenomenal breakthrough, like you know, the, 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 the Holy Grail, the Fountain of Youth, all those kinds of things. And, but but, but that, that breakthrough still required you to do something about your lifestyle. It wasn't a new pill that you'd pop in the morning, and it wasn't a, a, a new uh, uh, device that you attached to your body but it was actually required a new habit. We think of habits, brushing your teeth is a habit. Okay? It's a good habit. It's a habit that you probably do twice a day if you're like most people. You get up in the morning, you, you eat your breakfast, you go through your routine, and at some point there's a cue where you say, now it's time to brush my teeth. And you do it, and if you don't do it, then you, you're all agitated probably. I didn't get to brush my teeth today. And so, Bathing is another one, and, and, and we, we have all these habits in our life. Some habits are good, some are bad. So let's presume that the new breakthrough required you to make a new habit. Okay? The other thing about this that's really curious is, is let's pretend that the new habit was a form of physical activity, but it was a form of physical activity you've never done or seen before. Okay? Please don't think that I'm suggesting that this is we're just going to go on, a, on a, you know, some kind of exercise spree. Now, this is a new way to, to use your body. Now, I'm being a little vague here because we really want to get at your perceptions. And, and we want a, a, a blank slate to, to, to ask this question properly. So, the, the thing about this is, is the first question deals with your health. And then, then you'll see the second question that I have uh, deals with uh, how well you feel. And that was this part here. How well you feel. Okay, so let's back up a little bit. And so we're going we're gonna to go through a couple of these, these uh, issues. Um, with the first question, we're really getting only at the health. And let's assume that the scientific breakthrough said that the amount that you protect your body from a disease, a chronic disease, those are the nasty diseases you don't want because they don't go away. These are diseases like dementia, you know, Alzheimer's disease, it might be type 2 diabetes, it might be heart disease, and while we might mitigate some of the symptoms, we really can't cure those diseases, okay? And so what I'm saying is that the, the new way of, of using your body might be able to prevent that. And the prevention is proportional to how much you take the opportunity to do your new habit. So with tooth, tooth brushing, two minutes a day, if you do four, you're not going to get any better benefit, but you only do about five seconds, it might help a little, but it's not going to be quite enough for the full protective benefit. So what we're going to pretend is that 
the, the, uh, the, we call this dose response, much like how much of a dose of medicine do you take. And so we're going to pretend that the dose response is something like this, meaning that if you do this new behavior, we're going to call it LEPA. So LEPA sounds like you're, you're jumping or leaping. Well, I'm not, really, I'm not talking about jumping and leaping, but that stands for low-intensity physical activity. And so this new form of low-intensity physical activity right now is vague in your mind, and it's intentionally meant to be vague. So if you do this behavior four hours, you get the full protective benefit. So you get to choose whether you want the full uh, effect. But you might say, you know, I don't really care that much about my health. Well, yeah, I kind of care, but you know, I don't know. You know, and there are people like that. And I can tell you some really fun examples, but I won't do that. Um, and they might say, I'm going to buy in halfway, because two hours a day to do this new habit sounds like a lot anyhow, right? And then, then you, know, you, you, you might uh, uh, be one of these people who say, I'll take just a little bit. And you know, different strokes for different folks, that's cool. I want your honest opinion. That you're not being graded on this. I'm not going to know your name. I can't identify you. This is purely to help us understand perceptions. Now, there's a couple things about this, though. And we're going to go through a few of these. Um, one of them is, I've already mentioned that LEAP is something you haven't done before. But there's another one here. It says that you can simultaneously do this when you're doing sedentary stuff like watching TV, socializing with your friends, maybe even at work. Just about any place that you normally sit or lie down and just, just veg out. This is something that you could replace that time with. doesn't mean you stop watching TV at all. It doesn't mean that you have to change your clothes and get sweaty and go on a workout. Okay? The number one reason why people don't exercise, you know what it is? Lack of time. Okay? It doesn't matter whether you are, are 20, 12, or 92. You perceive that I'm busy and I just don't want to take the time today. So you don't make it a habit. So now what we're saying is let's, let's just guess that this new breakthrough says that simultaneous to the normal sedentary behaviors that you're doing already, you can, you can do this new behavior. Now, the key, the key to this, though, is that you, you probably also need to know, well, how sedentary am I? This four hours a day, what am I buying into? If I were to give you a device that I'm actually wearing right now on my body, that tells me every single second of the day what I'm doing in terms of my activity. It tells me if I'm sitting, it tells me if I'm lying down, if I'm moving, if I'm stepping, and so on. It tells me everything I'm doing. And, it, and we've put this on hundreds of people now. And guess what? The average American is now sitting over 10 hours a day. Okay? Over 10 hours. We've done it in children here in Baton Rouge, and we thought, we're going to get some sixth graders, because those kids... They're independent enough that they can be up moving around. They're not really relying on mom too much anymore. But they're still healthy. So we said, these sixth graders are going to be really active. Guess what? The sixth graders in Baton Rouge are more sedentary than women your age. OK? Is that scary? We put it on, we put it on all kinds of people. Then we said, women between 40 and 75 were more active than 11 and 12 year olds. Okay? These kids were healthy. They didn't have bad knees, bad hips, bad backs, bad feet. They didn't have pre-existing disease and they didn't have jobs. Okay? Well, they went to school. And what, what happens at school? They sit, okay? And it's compulsory, okay? But I'm not talking about getting standing desks. Don't, when I said LEPA, don't get biased. I'm not talking about that. Okay, we, this is going to take a new breakthrough, I said. All right. The other thing was we went and got college students, and we got young adults, 20 to 35. We said, they'll be the active ones in our society, right? You know, you picture them um, always wanting to look good and to, to be out getting their sun tans while they're playing Frisbee. They were more sedentary than people your age. You guys grew up in a different generation, and you developed some habits. You might be willing to, I don't know, wash the dishes manually. You might be able to do these things. My kids don't know how to do that. Okay, That's a skill. It's like learning how to fix the engine of a car. I see a few men in here, 
And I grew up where we still fixed engines on cars, but my son, he can't do that, okay? It's just mind-boggling to him that I would ever get grease on myself. So, all right, the other thing about this new behavior is it won't cause soreness. It won't hurt you. Now, there are many forms of exercise you've got to be careful. What do they always say? Before you engage in this new behavior, go see your doctor. Well, that's a turn-off. That's like taking one of those medicines where they say, if you take this medicine, you better consult with your doctor. If you're going to change your diet, well, that tells me there's a risk to it. I don't want to do a risky behavior. I want to do something that's safe. All right. And I've also said that it's something you can do even up to the age of 100. Okay, so now I'm giving you clues about what the behavior is, but I'm not going to tell you. In fact, I'm not going to tell you at the end of this talk. You're going to be all very frustrated. Why? Because I want you to know that when we do research here, we don't want to do it in a biased way. So we have camouflage. We, do, we call that placebo. We do things in ways that not, not even the investigator sometimes knows whether or not I think this is a great idea or a bad idea. My ideas don't matter. What matters is the, is the truth, right? And so all of you have an opportunity to participate in research. A lot of you have tried to do studies here at the Pennington, and you've probably been frustrated sometimes. They say, they told me I was too skinny, I was too fat, I was too old, I was too young. Or I just don't want to be in that study. That sounds painful, okay? Well, I do studies that are very painful sometimes, but they're very important. And it, re and, and it requires maybe looking inside your body. So, so the pain, when I say painful, it's, it's, it's temporary pain, okay? It's things like I might have to put a needle into your arm or something. Okay, so we do that. But we also are starting a new study that anybody can do. In fact, if you've been turned away before, you're the kind of person we want because you might have a pre-existing condition or something like that. And, it's, and so that's a fun type of thing. The only way that you can get to do that, though, is if you let us know, and then we'll contact you back, okay? This is a, this is a study that's not currently uh, enrolling people. So there's a way to go into one of these recruiting rooms. It's across the hallway, I think. And they'll just say Dr. Hamilton's study, and they'll take down your, your contact, and then one of my people will call you guys, okay? So, all righty. So now we're going to go through this a little bit, make sure I get this working. The second one I should add, I forgot to tell you about the feel-good thing, is let's assume that the new breakthrough might improve your health, but maybe it won't. But it for sure will make you feel better, okay? All those things that we, we lack, you know, you lack the energy, so you go drink the coffee, or you, you, you try to change your diet, and you do all these things, eh, they might work, but that they, they're temporary. But well, let's, let's pretend that the new breakthrough maybe helped your health, but for sure it helped your feelings, okay? And I want to know, what do you care more about? Now, scientists care all kinds, they, they usually care more about the disease, right? Or they might, maybe if you're a psychologist, they care more about the feelings. I want to know what's on your minds, okay? So give me your honest answer. So we're kind of comparing those two questions, and we're going to be able to say, do these people care more about their feelings, or do they care more about being able to prevent disease, all right? Okie dokie. Um, this is self-explanatory. So if you change your answers at any point today during the talk, that's fine. In fact, that's even more information for me. Just let me know. And please return those. I've been told before in the past that when, when you, get, you get all this stuff handed out to you, people don't like to return it. Okay? And so we've got, we've, you go to the front desk and they'll tell you, put it in a box somewhere. It's like a basket, I think, black basket. All right. Ashtrays. What can we learn about ashtrays? For, learn from ashtrays, not about ashtrays. You know, you know what they are. If, I think everybody in this room is of age to say, we remember what ashtrays are. Okay? Do you know that that used to be the most common form of decoration in a house? You couldn't have a birthday or a Christmas or even come over to a friend's house without giving them an ashtray. Isn't that kind of curious? Even if you didn't smoke, you had ashtrays. Now, what does that tell you? You can tell where I'm going with this, I bet. Huh? What can we, this lady looks very glamorous, too, doesn't she? She's kind of, she knows how to do it in a dainty way and looks very nice. But men look cool doing it, too. And I'll show you a picture of a man in a second doing it. Now, look how glamorous she looks. That's cool, huh? 
Okay? Now, if I was standing up here smoking right now, I bet you, A, I'd probably get fired, okay? We now have a policy on this. I probably should say this quietly. I'm on the policy committee, and it's now illegal to smoke at the Pennington, okay? Well, everybody's going to clap, but hold on a second now. 20 years ago, or maybe 50 years ago, you wouldn't have clapped, okay? Why'd you change it? Why do you want to clap now? Why'd you clap? Oh, she says she doesn't have to smell it. It's offensive to her, okay? And if I was at a parade, one of these Louisiana Mardi Gras parades at all the debaucheries going on, and I brought my little kids, nobody minds that you bring your kids to these horrible little parades, but if I was smoking a cigarette at that parade, I bet you would tell me, you bad man, you're smoking in front of your children, you're blowing that smoke on us, it's offensive to me, right? Oh, you wouldn't say that to me because you're very polite. Okay, but some people might think it, right? Okay, well, you're very kind. Um, but that's the how attitudes have changed. At one time, we used to decorate our houses with ashtrays and say, blow smoke in my house, I don't even smoke. And I've got little kids trying to sleep, it's okay. Right? All right, looky here. All right, I don't, I don't know what your politics are, but Ronald Reagan smoked cigarettes. Huh? How about that? And guess what Ronald said? I'm sending Chesterfields, they don't even make those anymore, folks, to all my friends, that's the merrier, merriest Christmas any smoker can have. And this was PR. This was trying to, to, in other words, engage people, spend your money on us, and we're going to do it. It's a feel-good experience. It's not dangerous. It's like number two. Okay? It's not, eh, maybe it's kind of bad, but it's not that bad. I grew up, and you're going to think I'm, I'm kind of, you know, a nutso guy by now already, so I'm just going to share this with you. I grew up in Texas where tobacco products were just like this, okay? You think I'm kidding you. What did I get in my stockings every year? Every year. Tobacco products. My mom gave us all our little pipes when we were little kids. She smoked a pipe. She figured we wanted to smoke a pipe. And we got new flavors of tobacco every Christmas. I got the Clint Eastwood cigars. And women may not know, but the little short brown cigars. I got chewing tobacco. It was a bounty of, of tobacco. And I'd go in my room. I'd go with my friends. It was open, baby. My PE teacher at school smoked chain smoker. My bus driver, chain smoker. My teachers, chain smokers. We all were just little candles, okay? <laughs> we didn't think it was dangerous because Mama gave it to me because Mama did it, right? Okay, so my wife hates when I tell that story. She says, they're going to say you're a redneck, you're, you're a bad person. No, I was not a redneck. I was cool, okay? That's the Marlboro man, okay? This doesn't show up so good in this room, but guess what? He's handsome, he's rugged, and he lives in a world of galloping horses, open spaces, and blood-red sunsets. That was me, okay? I rode horses, I broke arms on horses, I did all kinds of macho things, and that was, that was something that was cool to do. All right? Now I'm ostracized if I were to do that, so I don't do that anymore. But you know what happened, I think, in the early 1970s? The federal government started to say, maybe this is hazardous. Okay? These little rectangular boxes said things like, if you're pregnant and nursing, this may be hazardous. If you're under the age of 12, it may be hazardous. They had all these disclaimers. They didn't just say, smoking is hazardous. Remember that? They kind of slowly inched out, all right? And they put these, and now it's very hard to even advertise uh, in the tobacco industry. So what are we learning? One of the things hopefully we're learning is that some things that are common may seem safe because they're common. But anything, that doesn't make it safe. It just means that we're all exposed to the hazard. So the purpose of medical research is, just, is to determine new hazards and to find solutions to it. Big breakthroughs mean you have to have a big change in the way you're thinking. 
Smoking was an example. Maybe there's something that you expose yourself to, all this sitting that you do, that's more hazardous than smoking. Maybe it's more common, because maybe you didn't grow up in South Texas with chewing tobacco. But guess what? Maybe you are exposed to something that's even more, affecting more diseases than smoking. Just maybe. Okay? So, you see any ashtrays in this room? Probably not. All right? But they look very happy. The parents are even supervising the behavior. It's kind of like my PE teacher, Ms. Tribig. She supervised my behavior, and I learned from her. All right? So, do you see anything that's insidious? Meaning it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not so obvious, but it sneaks up on you like a snake in the grass? What are they? Yeah, they're all kind of resting, aren't they? Okay. All right. Well, how about these women? They look happy. She's smiling. They look very uh, engaged. They're touching a, a, a screen of some sort, computer screen. Maybe they're doing something that's not hazardous. What does the workplace look like these days? How many people actually use their body when they work? I mean, it used to be a blue-collar worker was the guy who had to get dirty and use his body. And then, you know, there were a few of these white-collar guys, but nobody wanted those desk jobs. When I grew up, you always said, what are you going to do when you grow up, Mark? I don't want a desk job. Why don't you want a desk job? It just seems boring, sissy. I want to work, okay? I want to, I want to cut down a tree, or I want to get on a shrimp boat and pull in nets. That was cool sounding. Well, you can't do that anymore. I can't afford to do that. So we do these kind of jobs. Even blue-collar workers, meaning that you maybe aren't the executive who gets to boss people around, you have to use one of those machines. Okay, so in, uh, in, in medicine, we have ways of diagnosing whether or not somebody is at risk for imminent doom. And all of you have seen the movies, you've seen the TV shows, and what have you seen? You've seen these kind of little wiggly lines, and usually he's making some kind of beeping noise, and then when this happens, it goes ee. All these doctors and nurses rush into the room, and you know something's bad happened to that person, right? So there's great diagnostic value to measuring this. What it's measuring is the electricity that emanates from your heart and into the skin of your chest, okay? So flatline signals are bad things. Just remember that, flatline signals, it just basically means there's no electricity coming out of that part of the body. Dangerous. All right, this is measuring the same kind of electricity, but in my lab, we can do it where it comes out of your leg muscles. So look here. You can be standing, you can take four little steps, and then you can plop down in a chair. And what happens? Flatline signal. This is real data. And we have these devices we put on people, it doesn't hurt you, but it tells you whether or not something is bad happening under your legs. Just like in your heart, it means that when the heart stops beating, that's bad news. When a leg muscle stops contracting, it's bad news. Okay? So. Warning, maybe that sitting too much, I used to always say, maybe sitting too much. Well, that was five years ago. There's now been thousands of studies that have confirmed this idea. And I'm going to show you a little of that data in a second. Okay? So we're just going to say it. Sitting too much may be hazardous to your health. And technology always advances. I cannot stop technology advancing. Every technological advancement that I know of that's, that's revolutionized the way we work and the way we live at home has made us more sedentary. Think about it. Before cable TV, who really cared? Before you had a PC at work, you were doing something else. I mean, it's, it's changing. Even the cell phones we have. I mean, at one time, I refused. I'm not getting one of those cell phones. I'm not going to do it. And I held off for, for years. Eventually, I got one. Now you get one, you're just staring at it. You're not moving when you do that. Okay? So this guy is really ramped up. And the cartoonist, have, there's a million cartoons now on this. It's really fun. So you can see he's figured out a way that he doesn't even have to walk to the kitchen. Okay, so reactivating the human lifestyle in a very sedentary world is a tricky thing to do. Trust me, it's a very tricky thing. Um, that's why we need your help in the research. And everybody wants to, me to be the Pied Piper and say, I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. I don't want to do that because I can't tell you right now how many hours a day you need to do, develop this new habit. And I can't tell you exactly what the habit is. I've got personal opinions, and I've got data to support those opinions, but we're not going to tell everybody right now, maybe in a year, maybe in six months. 
Okay? So how can this be achieved? It's a big question, and it's, 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 it can have revolutionizing, if that's a word, type of effects on the cost that we all incur at, in, in our workplace. I mean, a large part of the employer's cost is, is medical insurance. You look at all the political battles that are going on right now at the state and federal level, health care is right up there. If you look, at, you look at what's equitable and fair, forget that. People are looking at the bottom line, the dollar amount. Okay? There are all kinds of social issues tied up in this, and we need to find a solution, and I can promise you it's not going to come from the pharmaceutical industry. The, if, you, if you have stock in the pharmaceutical industry, be careful. Okay? I've been funded by those guys for a long time. I'm all for it. There's nothing wrong with it. We need it in a certain place, but it's not going to be a preventive medicine. It's not something that's going to keep you from getting the disease. It'll be fine once you get it to kind of alleviate some of the symptoms, but we're not going to cure obesity, heart disease, and diabetes with more medicines. Trust me. Okay? So, there's some creative suggestions. Uh, this one is uh, a little too creative, okay? But the idea is to get one of those six-pack abs, maybe even more than six. And you can see that if you wear this, the idea is it's going to create a little indention on your skin. Not to make fun of the ladies. The guys are just as bad. This dude, he says, what? Jeff recommends it. He says, chicks dig it. So he's got the remote control in his hand. He's, he's doing his best. Uh, we, we're not looking at those ideas. Okay, I'm going to show you some of the things real briefly. We have about, I think, five minutes. Um, real briefly, some of the kinds of results that have led to our thinking here. Yeah. And so one of them is that a lot of times you say it's my genes that have made me the way I am, you know? Well, what we've learned is that we've, we've got a technology now, and this is one of those things that takes a little pain, so don't think that you have to volunteer for this, but we can go into your leg muscles or into your fat tissue, and we can take a little snippet of the tissue, like a grain of rice, and then do some chemistry on it, and we can see if the genes in your body are turned on or turned off. Every single gene that the human being has. There's about 35,000. And so then we can say, how can we activate the good genes and turn off the bad genes? Kind of cool technology. And we actually started this over a decade ago. So what we've learned is that very rapidly, within hours, many good genes are turned off by sitting, and many bad genes are turned on. Okay? Point one. Point two is that we can look at your blood. How healthy does it look? And so this is what your blood looks like, what you want it to look like, after eating a meal. It's nice and clear. Okay? This is the, what's called plasma in your blood. This is the same person eating the exact same meal, the only difference is we changed their behavior after they ate the food. Okay? So nutrition is important, but where that food goes in your body and the way it's metabolized is very complicated. You can think about it like cars in a city. There's a lot of pathways for that car to go. So you can have a nice car, but you can run it off the road, or you can run it into an alley. You want to run that car in the right place. And that's what happens with, with physical inactivity, this stuff. That reason it looks so milky is it is milky. That's fat. Okay, that's the bad cholesterol and fat in your blood. You can visibly see it. You don't even need a machine. Scary thing is that we've shown time and time again now that exercise is not the perfect antidote to sitting too much. Exercise is important, but it's not the perfect antidote for this. Okay, there are two different types of problems in the body. All right? So this just reminds you that when we eat our food, even healthy food, there are many options for how it's going to be metabolized, where it goes, and how it affects you. Big time difference, depending on how active or inactive you are. Okay? So I'm going to give you one example of a, of a specific gene that's been heavily, heavily studied before us even, but we've tried to say, how can we make it go up? And so what we've learned is that this gene is like the vacuum cleaner for fat in your bloodstream. Without it, you can't get rid of the bad fat. Your bad cholesterol gets worse. Your good cholesterol gets worse. You get heart disease. You get diabetes. You get obese. You store fat where you don't want it to be stored. All those bad things happen. All you need to remember is this. This is how much this enzyme is working when you're just milling around, puttering around. This is how much it's working when you sit down. We've shown this in rats. We've shown it in people. It's a very scary thing. 
Okay? This is measuring the, the hormone called insulin. Insulin is absolutely required to get the blood glucose, the sugar, out of your blood into your tissues. Without it, you, you can't do that very well, and it causes what we call diabetes. All right? So one of the things we can do is we can say we can take people who might be at risk for diabetes. They're like this, meaning they eat a meal, and they can make a lot of this insulin, but the body's not responding to it. So the body just keeps making more and more and more. But it's just, it's irrelevant. It's, it's not responding to it. Same people, these are two individuals, one day later, one day later, and we could bring it way down here to this healthy level. They look like athletes now. Okay? And one big point here, too, is now there's these other kinds of studies that are doing what we call epidemiology where they can take thousands of people and say, you got a good idea, let's test it in the real world, so to speak. This is your chance of death within a couple years if you have different amounts of sedentary time. Okay, this is one hour, two hours, so on. Okay, excuse me, I've got this backwards. This is a, this is a lot of, uh, of activity, so it's a low amount of sedentary time. So the bottom line is that if you become more and more sedentary, you have more chance of death. But look how steep that is. We're talking a doubling in your chance of death from sitting more, 25% more than these people. You come up here seven-fold increase, 12-fold increase. You never see that with anything else. So it suggests to us it's a, it's a serious and a common health hazard. Okay? Um, so. If you haven't filled out your questions, you're, you're welcome to do so now. You don't have to do it, but it will be used in medical research. And if you're interested in participating in studies, you're welcome to go across to the, uh, the hallway and sign up. So, Ann, do you want us to take any questions here or no? No? Okay, thank you.